The Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act is an important part of the environmental regulatory system in Queensland. So in this lecture, we're going to move on to look at it and we're going to cover the major parts of it in the context of the overall course really because I don't, I don't want to overemphasize it. The EPBC Act is an important part of the framework but state and local government issues are much more prevalent in practice so I didn't want to start with the EPBC Act and work down because that would really I think give a false sense of the importance of the Act. In practice the EPBC Act relatively rarely gets triggered and is relatively rarely uh, important for your day-to-day -day work so I want to I brought it in at the end of the course or not quite the end but um, well, uh, well into the course and focused on the planning framework to start with because that's fra that framework is so much more important for day-to-day -day work rather than the Act, the EBBC Act. I also want to just point out to start with that, as I said in the first lecture, you can think of teaching and learning in a complex course like this, a bit like a game of chess. So there's many different pieces that are moving. So the group assignment was a big part of um, this overall course. And so there's been many things that I hope you've learned from it. And the earlier lectures are also parts of the things that I, I hope you've learned. This course keeps going uh, and it's not gonna taper off. So we've completed the group assignment and I hope you've learned a lot from that. But the final lectures cover important topics and the, the online exam that will conclude the course aims to help you draw together, remember and apply key concepts that you will need through your professional career. So I want to see it in that context and this lecture in that context. I know with many courses, at least in my experience, that you know a lot of information at the start and then they sort of taper off to the end. But we are going to keep going until the end with the important parts of what you need to know for your professional careers. So in that context, this lecture is, I'm going to use the, th the problem-based uh, approach that I've used in earlier lectures, but I want to start with a story and set the importance of this act in its historical context. And I want to tell you the story of the Tasmanian Dam case in 1983. And then I'm going to just use that to make some key points about the relationship between Commonwealth and state laws in Australia, because that is foundational to working in the system to understand how state and federal laws um, fit together. Then we're going to solidify that by looking at the EPBC Act in practice. And I want to look at three problems, mass culling of flying foxes in North Queensland, a coal project and a dam project. Then we're going to use those problems to outline the operation of the Act, the referral process, matters of national environmental significance, bilateral agreements. I want to touch on briefly some proposed changes, criticisms and current review of the Act. And then we're going to wrap up by answering the questions that the three problems raise in applying the Act. So, as I said, remember to keep the importance of this Act in perspective. There are relatively few projects referred under it each year. I've put the figure between 50 and 400 because the Act has been in operation for 20 years and there have been periods when there have been hundreds of referrals being made those have tended to be the uh, economic boom times when there's a lot of mining projects in particular on. The numbers are right down beneath 100 referrals or so um, each year at the moment. And that's Australia wide. So bear in mind that, you know, there's only say 100 referrals under the EPBC Act each year, but there's over 250,000 development applications under state and territory planning laws each year. So hundreds of thousands of planning applications. The EPBC Act referrals are relatively few in comparison. 
Now, while projects are very rarely refused under the EPBC Act, it plays an important role, particularly as a check on large state infrastructure projects, and that, that's the role it plays in our system. It's, it's, it often is just a secondary approval to state level approvals, but when the state government is the proponent of those projects, the EPBC Act sometimes plays an important check on those projects. So uh, I say sometimes because not always. We've seen in earlier lectures the um, Paradise Dam, for instance, which was assessed under both state and um, federal laws and uh, was approved under both and has been a catastrophic failure both economically and environmentally. So it doesn't always work to protect the environment. In fact, um, that would even be overstating it. It rarely actually works to protect the environment, but it still plays an important role. So I want to, I want to start with the story of the Tasmanian Dam case in 1983 to give you a historical perspective. And stories like this are really important for you to understand the context that you're working in and make sense of complex concepts. I want to play you an extract from an ABC documentary called Saving the Franklin. It was aired over 10 years ago and it's got plenty of historic footage. So the events that it documented occurred in 1983 and it investigated the fight to save the Franklin River, which was a massive uh, dispute in Australia uh, at that time and was uh, is often seen as the birth of the modern Australian environmental movement but also it's a cornerstone for the Australian constitutional system because it uh, rewrote the relationship between our national government and state governments and so any student studying constitu constitutional law in Australia studies the Tasmanian Dam case. It's one of like the key things that you study as a constitutional law student. So I'll play you this documentary. I'm just going to play the, the documentary runs for 25 minutes and you can find it on the UQ website. You can also find it on other um, educational websites. I'm going to play you a, a part of it, the first three minutes, and then I'm going to leap forward to about 19 minutes into the um, pro program and the bits I want to extract are just the starting sort of context and then the link to what happened in court uh, because ultimately this dispute went to the High Court of Australia which is Australia's highest court and the decision of that court is uh, what is important for us. <laughs> The Franklin River flows through a remote wilderness in the southwest corner of Tasmania. For thousands of years, it had remained untouched. In the early 1980s, the Franklin became known to millions of Australians. The Tasmanian government had plans to dam the river. It was to be part of a massive hydroelectric scheme. But in 1983, these plans came to an abrupt halt. The High Court of Australia stopped the project after the biggest environmental battle Australians had ever seen. The fight for the Franklin would be a turning point for Australia's conservation movement. Preserving the environment became a national cause. The fight over the Franklin River was between two groups with very different opinions, the conservation movement and the Tasmanian government. While the government planned to dam the river for a hydroelectric scheme, the conservationists wanted the Franklin to remain undeveloped, and both sides strongly believed they were right. Let's take a closer look at the two groups, what caused their dramatic confrontation on the river, and how had this conflict of values come about. 
On one side was the Tasmanian government and its hydroelectric commission. The hydro, as Tasmanians called it, was responsible for building dams and power stations for the government. As the state's largest employer, it was an important organisation. For almost a century, the hydro helped Tasmania's economy to grow. The dams and power stations the hydro built enabled the government to provide industries with cheap electricity. The huge amounts of power these industries consumed provided the Tasmanian economy with a healthy income. To the Tasmanian government, the development of hydroelectric schemes meant progress. The Hydro was a powerful and influential organisation. I'm going to jump forward to about 18 minutes into the documentary of the Hydro. The blockade had become the biggest news story in the country. The Wilderness Society's focus on the media had worked. No 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 they came from around Australia, pitched from Cairns, drove from Adelaide, flew from Hobart. 15,000 people walking through the streets of Melbourne. It was the biggest environmental rally in the country's history. Not since the Vietnam War protests of the 1960s had Melbourne seen such a dramatic expression of public opinion. In January 1983, less than a month after the blockade on the river had begun, a federal election was suddenly announced. How would this affect the conflict over the dam? Customers circulate in Diamond Valley? Well, there has been... The headquarters for the political battle is the Society's office in Melbourne. The main aim is simply to tip out of office government members in 13 key mainland marginal seats. That, in effect, means votes for Labor. Stopping the dam became one of the Labor Party's main election promises. Its leader, Bob Hawke, campaigned for votes at rallies organised by the Wilderness Society. I'd like you to give a very warm welcome to Bob Hawke, who, with your help, will be the next Prime Minister of Australia. It's great to be here on the platform uh, with such people as uh, Bob Brown, who I regard as one of the great Australians. If we meet the requirements in regard to power and jobs, then there remains no reason at all for a dam that no one wants as a dam. I want to say unequivocally because Apparently, there has been some attempt to suggest that our position is not clear. I say to you that when Labor comes into government after the 5th of March, the dam will not proceed. The Labor Party went on to win the 1983 election. Bob Hawke was the new Prime Minister. But the majority of Tasmanians hadn't voted for his party. Work on the dam continued as if nothing had happened. The Tasmanian government and the hydro simply refused to give in. The future of the dam on the Franklin is in doubt. This film was shot three days after Mr Hawke's announcement that the dam would not be built. And down below, the work is clearly going ahead as if nothing's changed in Canberra. Remember that before the federal election, the Labor Party promised to stop the Tasmanian dam. So how did it go about fulfilling that promise once it was elected? Well, what the federal Labor government did was to pass a new law. It was called the World Heritage Properties Conservation Act. Under this law, the federal government had complete control over all World Heritage areas in the country. But determined to fight on, the Tasmanian government challenged the new law. And that raised the question of who had the power over southwest Tasmania. 
the federal government or the state government? This was a constitutional question that had to be decided in court. The High Court in Brisbane has ruled that the Gordon Below Franklin Dam cannot be built. In July 1983, the High Court of Australia made its decision. The power over the Franklin rested with the federal government. It was a victory for the Wilderness Society and the conservation movement. They had defeated the Tasmanian government and the Hydroelectric Commission. The blockade on the Franklin was the final event in a seven-year campaign to... That's the key things that I wanted to just set the historical context for this lecture. So this is a picture that was made famous through that campaign. It was a, it was a picture by Peter Dombrowski and it shows the Franklin River or Rock Island Bend on the Franklin River. So this is a section of the river that would have been uh, flooded by the dam. And this picture was used in campaigning against the dam. And the Wilderness Society ran ads saying, would you vote for a party that would destroy this or dam this? And it became a massive rallying point for Australians uh, and the conservation sector, sector. So just to give you a bit of context, further context, so the proposed location of the dam was in Tasmania. So as you know, Tasmania is a massive island, a state of Australia um, off the mainland. So the location of the proposed dam was on the west coast. So um, the Gordon River flows out to the uh, west coast of Tasmania and it joins with the Franklin River and the dam was, um, the formal title of the dam was the Gordon Below Franklin Dam, or simply the Franklin Dam. So the Franklin River um, flows south at this point, and the Gordon River swings in from the south, so it's flowing north, and they join and then flow out to the west. So here's the Franklin River coming in from the north, and the Gordon River coming in from the south. The two rivers join and they flow west. And this is where the dam was proposed and it would have flooded massive sections including right up to Rock Island Bend which was further up the Franklin River. This is a map so I was because of the importance of this case for environmental law and constitutional law in Australia it's a major case study on my website and I went to the High Court Registry in Canberra and ask for some of the historic documents that were used. This is a map that was used in the court case to show where the dam was proposed. So it's a little looks a little bit complicated, but essentially here's the Franklin River flowing in from the north, and then here's the, the Gordon River coming in, and here's the proposed section of the dam. So just as I showed on that latest on that last Google Earth image. So the High Court also had uh, photographs that were tendered by the uh, federal government as part of the litigation and this was a photograph I asked a research assistant in Canberra to go in and take some pictures of them so she went into the registry and the re registry pulled out the historic documents and this was one of the big pictures um, you can see they've pinned it out with some wine glasses uh, on the table and my research assistant had taken a picture of it the same picture hangs in the uh, Australian National University Library and I was uh, I came across it a few years later I teach down at I've taught uh, several courses down at ANU and this picture was um, signed by all of the judges who um, made gave the decision in the Franklin Dam case uh, it was uh, the caption to it reads the Franklin Dam case uh, was one of the most momentous decisions of the High Court in the history of Australian constitutional law. By a majority of four to three, the High Court upheld Commonwealth legislation prohibiting the building of a dam on the Gordon River below the Franklin, thus effectively preventing the damming of the Franklin, Australia's last wild river. The case had been preceded by a tumultuous period of civil and political um, disobedience. In a celebrated incident dubbed by the media a spy flight, this photograph was taken in early 1983 by a Air Force jet under instructions from the Commonwealth Attorney General. 
It was tendered in evidence by the Commonwealth. The signatures are of the seven High Court judges, and they were obtained by um, a man who was working as an associate to one of them at the time and donated to the ANU Law School. So I got some of the pictures from the High Court file. This is what, so this was taken by a, a jet flying over Tasmania. So this is 1983. This, so this is, you know, early, it wasn't no Google Earth, no internet, uh, no great uh, spy satellites that could look in. They sent down a jet and took pictures. And if you think about it in the context of Australian government, this is pretty massive. This is the Commonwealth government effectively spying on what a state government is doing. So the state government through the Hydroelectric Commission was ignoring the fact that Bob Hawke had just been elected and had and committed to stopping the, the damming of the river and had passed new Commonwealth laws prohibiting uh, activities that damaged um, World Heritage areas without Commonwealth approval, which the dam didn't have. So uh, this image shows some of the a work site next to um, the Gordon River. And here's a road that was still under construction going into that work site, another part of the road. So these are all pictures taken by um, the Air Force. Uh, here's, you can see an excavator working there. And here's a point where um, things are being loaded onto barges. This is an image of the junction of the Gordon and Franklin River. So this is part of what would have been flooded. And here's just a, a, a beautiful picture taken from the Gordon River forest. So. Uh, it's a, a beautiful part of the world, just amazing forests. Now, the context for this dispute was also that the Gordon River had been dammed higher up uh, about a decade before. So the Gordon River Dam was constructed in 1969 to 1974. And this is a picture of it. So it's a classic high dam with a deep reservoir. And this uh, primed, there'd been a big dispute over the, this and the the flooding of what was known as Lake Pedder was uh, a really bitter uh, pill for um, conservationists in Tasmania and in Australia. And it really meant that there was this powder keg ready, ready to go off. So when this further dam was proposed uh, lower down the Gordon River, it sparked this massive civil protest. So here's a picture of some of the protesters at the dam site. So a lot of people went in and tried to obstruct the construction of the dam by the Hydroelectric Commission, which was a uh, corporation owned by the state government in Tasmania. Here's some protests against the dam being led by um, Bob Brown, who's still alive. Bob Hawke, who you saw in the news footage, uh, died last year, uh, former Australian Prime Minister. So this is that image that I said said before was used as an advertisement and this is a, a copy of the advertisement so uh, could you vote for a party that would destroy this so it was used as part of the political campaign by the wilderness society to defeat the then australian government which was bob hawke was an opposition leader so he was elected in march 1983 and the high court decided that uh, the Commonwealth had the power to stop the dam in July 1983. So only a few months later, which is a rocket rocket pace for um, court cases getting to decision. And it was decided so quickly because it was of such political and constitutional importance. I'm in a, just to give you a bit of context, I'm in a um, special leave application to the High Court uh, next month on the 5th of June involving the New Ackland mine, and that litigation has been going on since 2015. So five years later, we've it's taken us to get to, it's in the High Court, but and that's a sort of typical time frame to get to the High Court. This massive constitutional case was started and decided within a few months. So this is the High Court of Australia, the building that it's in. There's seven judges. Part of the context of this is that the legal dispute went to the heart of the powers to make laws for the Commonwealth government within Australia's federal system of government. So Australia, prior to 1901, uh, so uh, Australia was invaded in um, yeah, the, what, um, 1788 when the first fleet from... Uh, England or the United Kingdom arrived 
and and Aboriginal peoples were essentially uh, overridden by the um, essentially by conquerors, and then over the next couple of centuries, um, states were established. So that the first fleet, as it's called, uh, um, uh, arrived in Sydney, and then uh, over the next uh, couple of centuries, states were formed. Queensland um, became a state in the uh, 1800s, and uh, so by 19. 19- O one, um, there were six states, and they there was a push to form a national um, government. So all of those had previously just been colonies um, of the United Kingdom. So the Australian Federation was formed with a national government, and it was driven by two main things. First was the need for a um, defence of the, the whole country. The second was freedom of interstate trade. So they were the two big drivers that that pushed the states to form a national government. But the states still wanted to exist. So there's a, they, there was still these existing political structures. Push for states to form a, a national government coalesced into a written constitution. So Australia has a written constitution which sets out the powers of the national government. There's no recognition of local government within our national um, constitution. So in practice, Australia has 700 local governments and I think it's now down to about 540. There's been a lot of consolidation in recent years. Queensland has about 77 local governments. So normally in Australia, we talk about three levels of government. There's the federal Commonwealth or Australian government, the national government. So it's based in Canberra. And we use the words federal, commonwealth, Australian interchangeably. Then there's the six state and two mainland territory governments. And then there's the six or seven hundred local governments. Now, the local governments are all established under state and territory laws. And I'll come back to the question of the, the split in terms of who controls the environment. But when you see summaries of the powers of the government, you'll see commonly this sort of description that the federal government is responsible for things like defence and immigration. So the federal government's been instrumental in the response to the coronavirus. Um, state governments are responsible for things like roads and prisons, housing, public transport, police, ambulance and services, so hospitals and schools. And local governments deal with things like town planning, rubbish collection, sewerage and water, that sort of stuff, dog registration. Now, those are broad summaries, and most people are aware of those. Most Australians are aware of those just from their common day-to-day experience. In this list, it puts environment in the Commonwealth area of responsibility, but that's an oversimplification. All levels of government in Australia have important environmental responsibilities. What the Tasmanian Dam case decided was that the height, that the Commonwealth had ultimate responsibility and could override state laws in relation to environmental issues. Um, It was particularly focused on world heritage, but now it's um, a a really wide power that the Commonwealth uh, is recognised to have. So as I said, we've got a written constitution in Australia, and in our written constitution, Section 51 gives a list of powers, they're called heads of powers, that the Commonwealth government can make laws with respect to. So there's a fairly long list, but um, paragraph one says trade and commerce. So the Commonwealth has power to make laws with respect to trade and commerce, um, taxation, uh, quarantine. Uh, Number 10 is fisheries. Uh, Number 20 is foreign corporations and trading and financial corporations. And number 29 is external affairs. There's no specific head of power in relation to the environment. So one of the key questions that came or was litigated in the Tasmanian Dam case was, could the Commonwealth government make laws to protect the environment? What the High Court decided in essence in the Tasmanian Dam case, but then in a series of later cases, is that the Commonwealth Government has the power to enact legislation that is reasonably capable of being considered appropriate and adapted 
to fulfil Australia's international legal obligations. So I've put a handout up on the Blackboard site. Um, it's also just a page from my synopsis book, which summarises essentially the key constitutional powers that the Commonwealth Government has. One of the key things with these powers is that the width of Australia's international legal obligations means that the Commonwealth has a really wide power to make laws to protect the environment. So if you think like about... So the Tasmanian Dam case was about the World Heritage Convention, but the Australian government has signed up to a whole range of environmental conventions, including the Biodiversity Convention, which requires that Australia do all things to promote and protect ecosystems and regulate biological resources important for conservation. So it's a really broad obligation that's established under the Biodiversity Convention. And that translates in Australia's constitutional system into a really broad power for the Commonwealth to make laws to protect biodiversity. Another key component of our federal system is that under the Constitution, if the Commonwealth can make a law, it can override state laws to the extent of inconsistency. So this hierarchy is established in section 109, which says when a state law of a state is inconsistent with the law of the Commonwealth, the latter shall prevail and the former shall, to the extent of inconsistency, be invalid. So that meant that in the Tasmanian Dam dispute, the state government wanted the, ta the dam to be built. The Commonwealth government under Bob Hawke didn't want it to be built. The Commonwealth had ma made laws prohibiting projects like it. The state government had made laws allowing projects al and allowing this project to proceed. So there was an inconsistency between the Commonwealth law and the state law. And our written constitution sets up what happens in that case and the Commonwealth wins is the bottom line. So that all sounds simple in practice, but the reality is that inconsistency is relatively rare, that generally state and Commonwealth laws operate uh, and the courts interpret them to be consistent. And what it means is that you need uh, all relevant approvals at a state level as well as at a Commonwealth level. And if you don't get approval at a Commonwealth level, you can't go ahead with your project. If you don't get approval at a state level, you can't go ahead with the project. So, uh, and also if you can't get approval at a local government level, then you can't go ahead with the project. So in effect, that means that our whole system is complicated. And I wrote about this um, nearly a decade ago and tried and suggested that a way to think of it is that our system of government isn't like a neatly layered cake where there's discrete separation between each level. It's more like a scrambled egg where it's all mixed together. So when you um, ask the question who, which level of government protects the environment in Australia, the answer is, well, every level of government but the Commonwealth is ultimately in control where and when it chooses to be. So every level of government is involved, but the Commonwealth is particularly important. So that brings us then to the centrepiece of Commonwealth environmental laws, because this whole dispute started in, well, 1983, was this major um, court case. Then there was about 15 years of um, ongoing litigation and a series of Commonwealth cases. The Commonwealth reformed the laws in 1999 and enacted a new act called the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And it tried to basically settle all of the disputes and tried to map out where the Commonwealth said it was responsible and the things that it was interested in. So it called them matters of national environmental significance and that's what the EPBC Act is particularly built around. So that's background context for the EPBC Act. And also, I hope, makes this diagram that I've used in earlier lectures, it makes it um, have more sense. So 
in our legal system, I've suggested that at the top is international law. So things like the Biodiversity Convention, the World Heritage Convention, the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now they are not they're binding on the Australian government. They're not binding on individuals in Australia. They have to be implemented into domestic laws to be binding on individuals like you and me or a company operating in Australia. But international law in Australia is particularly important because of our unique uh, constitutional system and the history of how we came to be a country and because our national government doesn't have a general power to make laws to protect the environment under the constitution the interpretation given to the constitution by the high court in the Tasmanian dam case is so important because the high court recognized that the Commonwealth government can make laws to fulfill Australia's international legal obligations. At the same time, the Commonwealth government is the level of government that enters into international legal obligations. So what the High Court did was give an open door to the Commonwealth to really widen its ability to make laws because it controls both the Australia's international relations and those the obligations that, are, that it agrees to then give it constitutional powers to make laws with respect to those things. Can you see it's got both sides of the... the there are relatively li limited controls on what the Commonwealth then can do under the Constitution. And that was one of the big concerns that was argued in the Tasmanian Dam case was that this would destroy Australia's federal system of government. The reality that of, of what has occurred, though, after that is has shown that that was really an overblown argument because um, the Commonwealth has really exercised a restraint in not um, just obliterating the states and taking over everything. It's, it's now recognised that there is an important role for the states and territories. It can override the states, but it basically chooses not to. So the EPBC Act is not a complete statement of the Commonwealth's powers. It's really a limited subset. And the Commonwealth has a whole range of other laws um, like Ozone Protection Act, um, Fisheries Management, um, Gene Technology Act, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act, a whole range of other things, um, the Renewable Energy Electricity Act. So those are all based on its Commonwealth, the Commonwealth's constitutional powers. And then the states like Queensland have a whole range of laws like the Planning Act, the Environmental Protection Act in Queensland that are really important in practice and we've covered those earlier in the in the course. So those that's really the dynamic between the states and the Commonwealth. They both are really important levels of government uh, for the environment and then local governments administer laws that the state government um, has made. So the State Government in Queensland has made the Planning Act, which gives important powers to the local government. So, And the local governments are made under the Local Government Act as well, principally. The Brisbane City has its own um, legislation, but local governments generally are made under the Local um, Government Act. So they are, they are created effectively by state laws and they administer state laws, but we think of them as a effectively a separate level of government because in practice they... They are, but again, they can be overridden by the state government and they operate within the state legal system. And then down the bottom, um, I've mentioned the common law again. This is These are the laws that are made by judges, um, so things like negligence and the like, and they can be overridden by statutes as well. So that's the context for the EPBC Act So that and, and background. So if I want to move on to look at um, three problems to illustrate the operation of the Act in practice. Um, I noticed that it's 9.44. Um, I think this might be a good place to take a five minute break and uh, we can come back and we'll jump into those problems, set the context for the EPBC Act. Let's come back and with a fresh mind look at the EPBC Act in the context of three these three problems. So welcome back to the second half of our lecture. So before we broke, I was talking about the history of how we get to this point 
and the relationship between the Commonwealth and state laws in Australia. And we ended by talking about the EPBC Act briefly and that it's it's really the culmination of uh, a massive dispute um, starting in 1983 and rewriting the relationship between the Commonwealth and state governments and the Commonwealth's ability to make laws to protect the environment. But generally, it's not just the, the significance of the Tasmanian Dam case wasn't limited to environmental issues. It's really fundamentally changed the constitutional relationship between the Commonwealth and the states in Australia generally. For us, we're focusing on environment though. So the Commonwealth enacted the EPBC Act in 1999 and drew together a number of uh, issues that it said it would um, be responsible for or oversee and that's the what became matters of national environmental significance. I want to use three problems to illustrate how this act operates in practice. So the first problem involves, uh, I'll call it the flying fox case. This was uh, one of the first court cases that I was involved in when I started as a barrister, so soon after graduating from UQ in science and law and I was admitted as a barrister and so the EPBC Act had just come in to force when I was starting um, my professional career and a woman, a, a conservationist uh, in North Queensland called Carol Booth uh, came to me with a problem uh, that a farmer was killing thousands of bats um, on his um, farm and I, I thought, well, that can't be, that can't be right. Uh, who could be killing thousands of bats? Um, and the context of this is um, that fruit bats are really important for the environment. So this is a picture of the bats that were involved in this case. They're called spectacled flying foxes. And they're called spectacled flying foxes because if you look at this picture, uh, see this, this is a spectacled flying fox. Can you see the gold um, fur around its eyes? So different bat species have different colorations. Uh, the big bats, like um, this one, they're generally black or red. Um, so spectacled flying foxes, spectacled flying foxes have black fur, but around their necks they have um, a gold or browny fur. And then around their eyes, they have that goldy, sort of spectacled um, look. So they're called spectacle flying foxes because they look like they're wearing a pair of glasses. And this picture also um, is useful to look at because uh, it, you see this bat, it's um, hanging in a tree with a lot of flowers. So there's two big groups of bats. There's the small bats, the microchoiptera that eat insects in particular. So they're the little bats that you know, you're all familiar with that have echolocation and um, they generally fly around eating insects in the air. And so they're really small. Then there's the big bats or megachioptera and they eat fruit, um, blossom, um, pollen. Uh, so they fly around, they eat fruit. They also get the nectar from flowers. And when they um, fly from tree to tree, a lot of, just like everyone knows about b birds and, oh, sorry, bees, you know, going from flower to flower and spreading pollen. Well, flying foxes do exactly that same role for a lot of trees. So when the trees have um, flowers and put nectar, wanting to attract in um, flying foxes, um, the flying foxes land on the trees and when they're, um, eating the nectar, they get covered in pollen and then they fly to another tree and a bit of the pollen gets spread on flowers in another tree. And so they're really important for pollination in many tree species. They're also really important for seed dispersal in a lot of tree species as well. So these um, spectacle flying foxes are found only in two places in the world. Uh, one is in um, Papua New Guinea the other is in North Queensland. So uh, this is a map of the wet tropics World Heritage Area in North Queensland. So stretching from Cairns, um, just change this a little bit. So 300 kilometers, you've got Cairns there in the middle. So it stretches north to nearly to Cooktown and then south um, to Townsville. 
So the site where this farm was, was located about 100 kilometers south of Cairns. I'm just going to focus in on this area that's in the red circle. So the, oh, sorry, I should just say also that this um, satellite image is showing the wet tropics world heritage area in yellow outline. So if I focus in here, all of these areas in yellow are all part of the wet tropics world heritage area. And I'm just going to focus in on this little section here. So the farm was located between two patches of world heritage property in an area that's not really far off the Bruce Highway. So if you drive between Cairns and Townsville, you'll drive along the Bruce Highway. And the farm is just a little bit to the west of the highway. It was a massive lychee orchard. And you can see here the forest. So this is all part of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. So the Wet Tropics, basically this farm abuts the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area and the National Park. And um, pretty obviously the farm is built in an area that used to be um, part of the forest and that area had been cleared and then a lychee orchard um, planted. This is a picture of a lychee orchard um, with an electric grid erected above it. So what farmers were doing in the 1980s and 90s were, so they, they, clear, they were clearing forest and then planting lychee um, orchards. So the lychees come from Southeast Asia, um, uh, weren't native to Australia, but within the areas where they, they come from, they're naturally dispersed by um, flying foxes. So we were clearing, farmers were clearing forest and then planting um, lychee um, crops. And flying foxes, for a flying fox, it was like installing a supermarket because essentially it's just all this fruit that is is calling out to the, not calling out, but the um, aroma that um, the fruit, the smell of the fruit is meant to attract flying foxes to come in and feed on it. So the fruit growers were, were suffering a lot of damage to their crops due to flying foxes. So one of the answers that um, fruit growers came up with was to build electric grids like this. So can you see in this image, it's a little bit blurry, but on coming off this grid, there's these electric wires. So they built these grids and uh, electrified them with a high voltage current. And the idea was that bats would come in at night to feed on the crop, not see the wires collide with them and then be electrocuted. So this is the crop, you know, everyone um, knows lychees, they're a beautiful fruit. Um, just as a side issue, what do you think is the purpose of fruit for a plant? So something like a lychee, you know, it's got the seed in the middle and the flesh around the outside is what we eat and it's delicious. So what's the purpose of the flesh on the outside? Or if you think about an apple, you know that the seed in the middle is what, if you planted it, um, would grow into a, a, an apple tree. What's the purpose of the flesh around the outside. Do you guys want to come off mute and tell me? Anyone got an idea about what the fruit around the outside is for? Like the they apple really the, only um, needs the seed? Just yeah, they soil. attract animals like, to eat them. Animals. Yeah. And then the animal digests it and then the seed gets spread and then it grows more plants. Okay, you guys are too smart for me. You can see where I'm going with this. When you eat an apple, the flesh around the outside is not needed for the reproduction of the tree. Everything that the tree needs to reproduce is in the seed. The flesh around the outside is only to attract you, you as a mammal. So we often said if you've studied um, biology, um, they say we live in the age of the angiosperms and the mammals. So in the last few hundred million years, flowering plants have blossomed, uh, pun intended, uh, to be a massive um, source of um, the plant kingdom. So flowering plants that produce fruit have basically got a fantastic relationship with mammals. So they, the idea is you attract in a mammal like us to eat your fruit and then disperse your seeds. 
So the whole point of the flesh around the outside of an apple or a lychee is actually to attract an animal like us, a mammal. Um, so the smell, why fruit smells so nice to us is it's actually part of evolution. It's been basically wired into us to smell fruit that is edible uh, and apples. Um, so if you think about it, like fruit have been just so massively successful and they actually are so successful that, you know, we now go in, we don't just eat their fruit and disperse them, but we go in and we clear all their competitors. We plant them on nice fertile ground. We water them, we give them fertilizer and they give us fruit. Um, that's all that they have to do. They give us fruit and we are basically looking after them. So if you think about the world, plants have got that, you know, they're just such freeloaders. They've got us sewn right up. Humans, we go in and we just, you know, we clear all their competitors. It's a great, um, it's a great success story for apples and lychees and all these other things that we grow. We think we're in control, but really, I question who are, who's in control. So in that context, lychee farmers were, were growing, um, clearing forest, planting big crops of um, fruit trees that then flying foxes were coming in to feed on. And what farmers, they're obviously suffering a lot of fruit losses. So um, what farmers were doing in the 80s and 90s was building these electric grids. And that's what this farm was doing. And... Uh, Carol Booth went on to the property and took some footage. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. So here's a spectacle flying fox. Dead on the ground. And here's a spectacle flying fox hanging in one of those electric grids. This is on this property. And you can see a lot of bats up there. Carol went around the property and she found that there was 6.4 kilometers of these electric grids. And from counts of the number of dead bats each night, she went back over four nights and found that they were killing between 300 and 500 bats each night. So the lychee season lasts for six to eight weeks. So this one farm was killing between somewhere between 10 and 30,000 bats. So there's a dead spectacle flying fox. And here's a little young one that Carol has found. Amazing. And she'll speak on, in this footage in a moment. A bit more of the grid. morning. His mother uh, was killed on the power grid in the Ritchie farm and had fallen off and so we were able to pick this little baby up from her. I... You probably couldn't hear um, that very well. It was Carol saying that she had um, found this flying fox uh, and um, picked it up. So she was actually a, a bat carer and the reason why the young was there was um, its mother had been electrocuted. So flying foxes give birth in summer, which is December, um, November, December, January is when they give birth. And they're young um, when they're small. When the mothers go out to feed, the young actually cling to them. So the mothers fly with them, hanging on to them. So the mother had um, been electrocuted on the grid and the young was still alive. So this was happening to hundreds of bats each night um, and many weren't just being killed, they were being severely injured by it. Um, Carol um, had evidence as well that there were only about 100,000 of these bats in the whole of the wet tropics World Heritage Area. So uh, if you think about the context, these bats are critical for pollination and seed dispersal of many, many species in the World Heritage Area. This one farm, the, the total population is 100,000, and this one farm is killing between 10 and 30,000 uh, each in, in the lychee season of six to eight weeks over December. So the wet tropics was 
inscribed in the World Heritage List under the World Heritage Convention in 1988. And it was included for meeting four criteria of outstanding universal significance, including that it contain the most important and significant habitats where threatened species of plant and animals of outstanding universal value from the point of view of science and conservation still survive. And this is a quote from it. The wet tropics of Queensland provides an import, important habitats for conservation in the wild of biological diversity, including the only habitat for numerous species of plants and animals of conservation significance, which have outstanding universal value from the point of view of science and conservation. And the listing documents actually had a picture of the spectacle flying foxes or a, a spectacle flying fox. So the bats were part of the biodiversity of the wet tropics. And they're also critical for pollination and seed dispersal of hundreds or thousands of plant species. So even though they're flying out of the wet tropics world heritage area to a neighboring farm, they're still critical for the biodiversity in the wet tropics. So flying foxes, a bit more context. There's four main species of flying foxes in Australia. Spectacle flying foxes are only found in North Queensland. So if you're in Brisbane and you see flying foxes at night, they're not spectacle flying foxes. They're um, most likely black um, or grey headed flying foxes if they're big and black. Um, if they're smaller, little red ones, you see them. They're the little reds. So three species, we don't see them in Brisbane. Now, just you might be thinking, well, what about the farmers? Um, you know, why, you know, they need to be able to protect their crops. And um, I would point out that electric grids are not the only or even the best method for protecting fruit crops from flying foxes. The, the best way is to put um, netting over them. So a netted fruit orchard in North Queensland is shown in this image. So you can put up these nets and that excludes flying foxes and birds. And so you get a lot more fruit if you do that because the grids only work by basically wiping out the species. So there's a non-lethal alternative to the grids. So the question that I want to pose for us is, well, um, if that was occurring now, um, would the killing of flying foxes break any law and could it be stopped? So one of the laws that would be broken um, would be the Nature Conservation Act. Another law, as we'll see, would be the EPBC Act. Um, so we talked about the Nature Conservation Act in earlier lectures, and that's the state level law. And you know that it protects uh, protected species, which include any native mammal. So that's a killing a native mammal um, is a breach of set without an authority under the Act is a breach of Section 88 of the Act. We covered that when we were looking at nature conservation. Um, in this case, what happened back in 2000 was that Carol went to the state government regulator, the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, and said, help, this farmer is you know, killing hundreds of flying foxes. Um, the response she got from the regulator was that a ranger went out and issued the farmer with a permit um, to kill flying foxes. The, the, permit, the farmer did not have a permit at the time when the killing had, was occurring, but a ranger went out and tried to issue a retrospective permit um, covering the period where Carol had evidence that he'd been killing flying foxes. And um, the permit allowed for, I think it was killing of 500 spectacle flying foxes. And Carol's response to that was, well, you can't, we don't think you can issue a retrospective permit. Um, but even if you can, this farmer is killing more than 500 flying foxes every night or every second night. You've still got to take action. Why do you think, what, what do you think was the thinking of the regulator for doing that? Why would a conservation regulator see a breach of its laws and go out and basically give a permit? Continue Maybe the economic cost of litigation. Uh, uh, perhaps to continue economic um, outputs of the farm. 
uh, yep, the economic sense rather than I can imagine that litigation would cause the farmer to have some hefty, uh, I guess, um, uh, prosecutions against them. So that would uh, ultimately it could render the farm, I don't know, even under, it, maybe in that circumstance, it could be quite severe, I'm not too sure. But if you're the regulator, yep, then, and that's a fine answer, but I've just asked then the follow on, well, if you're the conservation regulator, you know, should should that be your concern? You know, shouldn't your primary concern be actually implementing your law and protecting these species that are critical, like coming out of World Heritage areas? This one farm is potentially driving the whole species, wiping it out, and that will have huge impacts on on the forest. You know, what, yeah. why, why would yeah. it take no action? It should be a concern. It could be down to the context of the cultural um, aspects of the area. Um, Not really. I'll pause you for a moment. Anyone else want to jump in with why you think the regulator didn't take any action? Uh, in, I think it was also something related to lack of experience, maybe for the regulator. Lack so, of experience? Well, because sometimes they don't have that. Um, Martha, you're just, you're just far too kind, okay? You're just far too okay. kind and... Um, so no, we're not going to put it down to lack of experience. This went up through the department. Um, this, you know, this the, the in, initial um, response was by an indiv individual inspector, but then this essentially they they didn't take any further action when Carol continued to complain. So and this farmer was killing then every night. Well, this this was in the, while the, fill, the killing was going on every night. Um, but is, in that in that sense, Chris, it means that there was corruption there. Yeah, corruption. The the term I've used in earlier lectures is regulatory capture. So yeah. it wasn't that the farmer was paying the department money. Yeah. It's really another example of regulatory capture where the the regulator effectively stops uh, enforcing the law against the um, people that are regulated. Um, and so it's a form of regulatory capture. But what drives it? So did anyone else want to jump in with it? What drives this regulatory capture? So this is farming. That's a big hint. Farmers form an important, they're, they're important stakeholders um, and they vote. Uh, they vote. Yep. So you're getting close. Yep. And they just don't vote, but. They, they feed everyone. They feed everyone. I'm start. I'm looking for a word. It starts with P, and the second letter is O. They influence the population. politics. Politics, oh. yes. It's all about the politics. So, mining and farming have traditionally not been regulated in Australia until recent, you know, relatively recent times. And there's still big hang-ups with enforcing the law against farmers and miners. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this was 20 years ago, um, but the same politics is still around. Enforcing, like, the EPBC Act against farmers is still a very controversial um, issue. And there's, it's still controversial at a state government level as well, although we've seen in relation to things like vegetation management, the state government has taken stronger action. You know, there was the phase out of... Um, broad scale clearing for agriculture in 2004 but all of this was occurring and still is occurring in a political context so this regulatory capture in this case was a reflection of the politics of what was going on okay so i'll move on um, i'll come back to how it's regulated under the eppc act and the action that carol took but um, she got a similar act. She got a similar response from the Commonwealth. They basically refused to take action. So that's one problem: flying foxes. If someone was killing hundreds of flying foxes adjacent to a World Heritage property, what are they regulated under? We know the Nature Conservation Act. We're going to come back to the EPBC Act. A second um, problem that I want to Put forward for you is a big coal mine so this is a coal project called waratah coal let's just say it was proposed now there's actually a decade ago this project was proposed but it's got some interesting um, context so let's just say it was being proposed now um, the proposed new coal mine is west of emerald 
Um, and what the miner was proposing to do was build a rail line out. So in 2008, it was a massive coal boom. Um, there's existing coal ports at Mackay and Gladstone. So the miner could have joined, sent out coal through either one of those existing ports. But at that time, they were facing capacity issues because there was so much coal going out. So the miner proposed to build a new coal port. So this project, let's just say it was to occur now, involves um, a big mine and a, a new coal port on the coast. And the coal port is located uh, just south of a military training area called Shoalwater Bay. It's also Ramsar listed. So um, the I'll come back to Ramsar listing, but um, the mine is also part of the Galilee Basin. Um, so this is a massive big coal basin that hasn't yet been developed. It's also where other big controversial projects have been proposed, including the Adani mine that we talked about in the first lecture. So this project, um, 3 billion tonnes of thermal coal, um, proposing to have 50 million tonnes of um, coal production a year. Gross value of the thermal coal um, would be less than that, but you're talking about billions of dollars worth of um, product. Greenhouse gases, if it's burnt, would be about 3.12 billion tonnes, um, about 8 billion tonnes of CO2, which is equivalent to about 14 years of direct emissions from the whole of Australia and equal to around three months of emissions from the entire globe. So here's the mine proposal, massive big mine, and these are just extracts from the um, documents that were part of the proposal. And then it was to come, the rail line was to come down and there'd be stockpiles on land and then a um, jetty going out for ships to load. So the proposal, again, this is all just extracts from the application documents. This is the rail line coming in. And it was to be just at the southern end of this military training area, which is also Ramsar listed. So here's some imagery from within that military training area. And yeah, just some imagery of nearby. It's a relatively, you know, one of the ironies of big military training areas is that the army likes to you know, keep the trees and stuff so that they can run around and, you know, play camouflage stuff in. So they tend to be um, pretty good areas for um, wilderness and animals to live in because um, the military doesn't go and, cl and clear them and develop them. They like to keep them relatively natural. So this area is a military training area, but it's still relatively natural. And, you know, that's they, military training areas have <laughs> remarkable um, biodiversity value often. So here's a bit of the coastline near where, where the proposed coal port was to go out. So if that project was proposed now, does a question I want to ask is, would it need approval under the EPBC Act? And if so, how does the process operate and is approval likely to be given? And then the third problem um, is a dam. And just choosing projects that show a range of different issues that might be regulated under the EPBC Act. So this, again, was a dam that was proposed about a decade ago. It was called the Traveston Crossing Dam. It was proposed on the Mary River in um, southeast Queensland. So just north of Brisbane, um, the Mary River flows uh, out um, into the Great Sandy Strait, which is a Ramsar area. And the dam was proposed in the catchment of the Mary River. So this is an image of what the dam was supposed to look like. And so it was proposed in the context of a massive drought occurring from about 2005 through to 2008. And it was the, I talked about, when we talked about the Paradise Dam and that um, litigation about that um, was about the, the lack of operation of a um, fish transfer device on it. So this dam was using the Paradise Dam as an example of what it would do to address um, fish transfer and also lungfish. So lungfish are found in the Mary River as well as in the 
um, Burnett River. They're, that's their two locations where they're thought to be endemic to. So only two locations. The in Back in 2008, when this project was being assessed, this um, was also in the context of where the Paradise Dam wasn't operating. And so the litigation in that Paradise Dam case that I was involved in was one of the purposes of it was about um, trying to stop this Traveston Crossing Dam. So in the, Mer in the Mary River, apart from lungfish, there's also a range of cool um, species. So this is a Mary River turtle. And here has to be one of the coolest pictures you will ever see of a turtle with this moss growing out of its head. So this is a Mary River turtle as well. So doesn't look cool. Uh, so, does this project need approval under the EPBC Act? That's our question. If it was proposed now, does it need approval at a federal level? And if so, how does the approval process operate and is approval likely to be given? So, within the context of those three problems, mass culling of flying foxes, a coal project with a port and a dam, let's turn to outline the operation of the EPBC Act. And I want to talk about the EPBC Act referral process matters of national environmental significance and bilateral agreements. So firstly, the EPPC Act sets up a series of triggers uh, that look like this. So this is section 12 of the Act. A person must not take an action that has or will have a significant impact on the world heritage values of a declared world heritage property or is likely to have a significant impact on the world heritage values of a declared world heritage property. So if you think about the um, flying foxes um, being killed, they were right beside the wet tropics world heritage property, but the damage wasn't occurring within the world heritage property. That ultimately doesn't matter because the way the act is set up for protecting world heritage you can take an action and it can be, you see the elements of this, so a person, so in that case it was the farmers, must not take an action. So the operation of the electric grids was an action, a physical activity, that has or will have a significant impact on the world heritage values of a declared world heritage property. So for the wet tropics, the world heritage values we saw includes biodiversity and that was part of its outstanding universal value. So if you cause a significant impact to biodiversity in the wet tropics, you are committing an offence against the EPBC Act. What the Act does is set up these offences and then sets up a referral and assessment process. So similarly, there's offences for causing a significant impact to the ecological character of a declared Ramsar wetland. So that's another one of the triggers, that's section 16. So I won't go through each of them, I'll just summarise them in this slide. I know that last, sorry, the bottom is cut off, isn't it? Um, but there's a list of nine matters of national environmental significance. I just mentioned too, for this um, lecture, that I've put up a handout on the Blackboard site, which has got this list on it. Um, so most of the images that I'll show in the next few slides is a little handout um, there too. I should have said that at the start of the lecture. So the matters of national environmental significance, there's nine. World heritage places, national heritage places, Ramsar wetlands, listed threatened species and listed threatened ecological communities, migratory species, nuclear actions, Commonwealth marine areas, the Great Barrier Reef, and mining and calcium gas impacts on water resources. We mentioned those in tutorials for the group assignment when we looked at the state planning policy and saw that in relation to biodiversity, the SPP, um, one of the outcomes that it seeks to protect is that it, it requires that um, matters of national environmental significance listed under the EPBC Act be protected. So that's at a state level, but that obviously comes from the Commonwealth EPBC Act. So there's nine things. Let's just unpack them a bit more. So in terms of world heritage, there's five world heritage areas in Queensland. So there's the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area running all the way down the coast, the wet tropics around Cairns, 
There's also Fraser Island, World Heritage Area. There's the Gondwanan Rainforest of Australia uh, as well, which is um, Ramsar, sorry, not Ramsar, is um, a series of rainforests around uh, southeast Queensland and, and northern New South Wales. And there's also a fifth up in northwest Queensland, which is a fossil site. So the Australian fossil mammal sites at Riversley. So they're the five sites. So that's relatively easy to remember. And they don't change uh, often. Most of those or all of those sites have been listed for a couple of decades. Then the second um, list of sites, um, there's a number of sites on the National Heritage List. So this is another one of the triggers under the EPBC Act. And here's 10 of them. Um, these can change more regularly than World Heritage Sites, but Notice the first one is Australian Fossil Mammal Site Riversley. Well, you might think, well, that's isn't that already a World Heritage Site? And the answer is yes, that is. Similarly, it also lists Fraser Island and the Great Barrier Reef, uh, as well as the Wet Tropics. So these are all on the National Heritage List. They're also on the World Heritage List. So you can see immediately there's a lot of overlap and redundancy between the matters of national environmental significance. The, the Great Barrier Reef is also listed as its own um, matter of national environmental significance. So the impacts on the GBR get potential triggers for both world heritage um, plus national heritage plus its, its own trigger in its own right. So there's a lot of overlap. Um, the act, yeah, is cumbersome in many ways like this. But the National Heritage List um, includes things that aren't um, otherwise listed. So the Dinosaur Stampede National Monument at Lark Quarry. I mean, before doing this um, list for this lecture, I didn't even know that there was a Dinosaur Stampede National Monument. And then the Elizabeth Springs, um, part of the Great Artesian Basin, the Gra Glasshouse Mountains uh, National Landscape. Oh, Gondwana Rainforest. I should have circled them before about they're also World Heritage um, the Qantas hangar at Longreach. I mean, there's some really strange, probably un relatively little known um, things listed on the National Heritage List. So that supplements, um, you know, the list of triggers um, significantly. And they also pop up in areas that um, might not be obvious. So, you know, if you had a project that was out at Longreach um, and was you know, might be a housing construction or a hotel. Um, it might trigger the EPBC Act, even though it's in town, if it's going to impact on the Qantas hangar site. So um, next on the list, Ramsar wetlands. So we've got World Heritage, National Heritage, Ramsar wetlands. Um, there's, again, five of them. So there's Bowling Green Bay um, in Townsville, um, Shoalwater and Corio Bays at Rockhampton, the Great Sandy Strait, Fraser Island, Moreton Bay near Brisbane, and Currawanya Lakes, which is in um, southwest Queensland. So five Ramsar wetlands. So these are wetlands, I think we talked about, um, at least in tutorials, these are wetlands that are important for international migratory species. And they're listed for that reason. So they're listed under the Ramsar Convention, which is an international convention. So Shoalwater Bay is an example of one of the Ramsar wetlands. So there's a trigger for actions that will have a significant impact on the um, uh, ecological or um, what's the exact word? Ecosystem values of the Ramsar wetland. It's not the right term, but a significant impact on the, re the Ramsar wetland. So the question becomes, is a um, project like this coal port um, does that trigger the act or not? So I, I'd also emphasize that Moreton Bay uh, has a large Ramsar wetland. So a lot of coastal development uh, in Brisbane potentially triggers the EPBC Act because of the uh, Ramsar wetland through Moreton Bay. Okay, next on the list, uh, listed threatened species. There's uh, over 1,700 listed 
threatened species and threatened ecological communities on the EPBC Act. This is just I've just done a screen grab of the list. So they're listed in categories that reflect the international categories used by the International Union, Union for the Conservation of Nature, so the IE, IUCN categories. So extinct, extinct in the wild, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable. Um, so species can be listed in those categories. Um, just as an example of a listed threatened species, this is the Australian lungfish uh, listing. So it's listed as vulnerable. So lungfish are listed under the EPBC Act. So a project like a dam, like the Paradise Dam or the Mary River Dam, the question becomes, will that action cause a significant impact on that species? Now, in addition to listed threatened species, the Act also has a, an ability to list ecological communities that are endangered. This is much less clear. So whereas a species you can think, okay, well, that's a threatened species like lungfish, the ecological communities include both flora and fauna. And there have been listings like um, Brigalow, um, but unlike a state level where there's good mapping, um, there's not good mapping of where these communities occur. So you can't get, so this is just an image showing um, mapping of general locations of um, Brigalow in central and southern Queensland and you can't um, go on to the um, EPBC Act website and get exact mapping of it. You can do like you um, may have done for the group assignment, you can go on to the EPBC Act Threatened Species um, uh, listing tool and do a search for species that might be in the area or that um, threatened ecological communities that might be in the area or World Heritage Sites and the like, but you won't get precise down to sort of property level um, exact locations of them. Once they're in the area, you then need to go and essentially have an expert consider whether what you're proposing will cause a significant impact or not. So there's more than 1,700 species and ecological communities listed. I just mentioned that. And as I said, you can do searches linked to maps uh, from on the EPBC Act website and generate reports about species and sites that might be in the area, but it won't give you um, precise information. Um, so in terms of the triggers, um, the only other thing I'd mention about them was they were added to in 2013 by what's called the water trigger. So this was, there was a political concerns, uh, or there was a lot of concern in 2012 particularly about massive expansion of calcium gas. And that led to um, a member of parliament at the time, Tony Windsor. He was an independent, but the Gillard government, he, he convinced the Gillard government um, as part of um, getting his vote he wanted them to create an, an extra trigger in the EPBC Act to deal with the water impacts of coal seam gas and mines. So the Gillard government um, changed the EPBC Act to include a water trigger. So that's now just part of the framework of the Act. So with those triggers, basically the way the Act works is like this. And again, this little diagram is shown in the handout I've given you on the Blackboard site. It works in three main stages. So if you've got a project that may have a significant impact on one of the matters of national environmental significance, then you have an obligation to refer it under the Act for consideration about whether it is um, controlled under the Act or not. And when you make a referral, it, if it, it's decided that it will have a significant impact, then it's called a controlled action and the provisions that are triggered are called controlling provisions. So if you make a referral and the Commonwealth decides that it is a controlled action, so it needs full assessment, then it undergoes two extra steps. One is the assessment and then approval. So those three stages are um, the steps in the EPBC Act. If the Commonwealth decides that there's no significant impact, then basically you've got an early exit. And about 80% of projects that are referred 
drop out. So if the decision is no, you don't go any further. You then essentially have a decision from the Commonwealth that it's not a controlled action, and then you don't commit an offence if you carry out the action. So um, relatively few go on to further assessment under the Act. I just would emphasise that the EPPC Act talks about referral process for controlled actions, but this is not part of the development assessment system under the Planning Act, which also has a referral part. I just mention that because um, I've seen in past exams that there's been a common misunderstanding in students that when they make a referral under the Planning Act, say to the state government under the SARA system, that the EPPC Act is um, wrapped up in that referral, but actually they're two separate that we've seen under the state government, there is some consideration of the um, EPBC Act issues, but the, that doesn't actually give you approval under the EPBC Act. I know that sounds confusing. They're using the same term, but they are actually um, separate processes. They they might be linked through a bilateral agreement to some extent. So what the EPBC Act did was because it knew it was coming in where there was a lot of state level assessments already and some of those projects underwent environmental impact assessment um, at a state level. So what the Commonwealth did when it created the EPBC Act was it set up a framework whereby state level um, EISs or environmental impact assessment could be used under the EPBC Act but with the Commonwealth retaining the ultimate decision on whether to approve or refuse. So these are called assessment bilaterals and they're in place for all states in Australia including Queensland. So Queensland has an assessment bilateral with the Commonwealth whereby particularly the EIS process under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act is used for the assessment of the project both at a state level but also at a Commonwealth level. So assessment bilaterals substitute the state environmental impact assessment procedure for the environmental impact ass assessment under the EPBC Act but the Commonwealth retains the ultimate decision. Now the Act also creates a ability to have approval bilaterals which hands the power to make the final decision to the state. So approval bilaterals have been really controversial and none currently exist. So they exist in theory and I'm going to mention in a moment there's been a proposal since 2012 for what's called a one-stop shop and that uses approval bilaterals fundamentally. So it's about handing the power to the states to make the final decision on whether something goes ahead or not. So as I said, there's bilateral agreements with um, only assessment bilaterals, uh, but for all states and territories. In Queensland, um, the Queensland bilateral allows for EIS procedures to be done under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act and that's the one that's generally used. So something like the Paradise Dam um, had an EIS done under the State Development Pub Public Works Organisation Act. Similarly the Adani Mine used the State Development Public Works Organisation Act um, and similarly the um, uh, project like the proposed Traveston Crossing Dam and Waratah Coal could have used um, well, um, Travis and Crossing Dam actually used the um, State Development Public Works Organisation Act for an EIS. So that's the one that's commonly been used. The Environmental Protection Act is recognised under the um, bilateral agreement, but I've never seen it used. So in practice, it's never used. And then the thing hasn't, the bilateral agreement hasn't been updated. It still lists the state, sorry, the Sustainable Planning Act which now is repealed, but it was never used anyway, so I can, there's not much point really in updating it, but the Sustainable Planning Act had an EIS process in it, and it was um, recognised under the bilateral agreement. So bilateral agreements um, are important, and in 
my synopsis book, I've got this flow chart that just explains um, the EIS process under the EPBC Act. So um, a proponent refer, refers an action under the EPBC Act. So if you're proposing to kill flying foxes, if you're a farmer and you're proposing to kill flying foxes and you recognize that you needed to have it approved or you're proposing to build this big coal mine and coal port or you're proposing to build this dam. So the state government was proposing to build the dam. And so um, each of those is bound by the EPBC Act. Even the state governments are. So they make a referral. And then there's a decision um, whether it requires assessment or not. And if you get a decision, if, you're de if the decision is no, that you don't require further assessment, then that's the end of it. But if your decision is yes, you need assessment, then um, it goes on to the assessment um, bilateral agreement process. Um, and then it can come back to the state um, for assessment uh, under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act in particular. There's also an EIS process and other methods of assessment under the EPBC Act. So if, this, if the bilateral agreement isn't triggered, it can undergo assessment under the the EPBC Act itself. So that's an outline of the operation of the EPBC Act. As I said, there's um, triggers for matters of national environmental significance. Um, if the Act is triggered for big projects, they typically undergo assessment under state level laws, particularly the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act in Queensland under a bilateral agreement. I just want to mention before looking at the three problems, I just want to mention some proposed changes and criticisms of the current Act. So in 2013, the Abbott Coalition, so it's the same party that was in power, but there was a different Prime Minister named Tony Abbott. Um, they proposed to enter into approval bilaterals and it was called the One Stop Shop. It was part of a deregulatory program or agenda of the government of the time. On paper, at least, it's still the government's um, proposal that there will be this one-stop shop where they will enter into approval bilaterals with all the states and territories and basically give the states the final assessment power. That stalled in 2014, basically because the state governments didn't want to take on the extra work. Um, I wrote an article back in 2014 about how I saw it as a messy backward step for Australia. So that's was a, an article in the Environmental and Planning Law Journal. But effectively, that process, it's still government policy at a federal government level, but it hasn't gone forward. Also, in 2015, there were some wild claims about lawfare under the EPBC Act, where there was some successful litigation against the Adani mine. So there's been some litigation under the EPBC Act. The Adani mine resulted in several... Um, pieces of litigation. One of the first cases um, led to an approval being set aside by consent when the federal environment minister recognised that he had made a mistake and had failed to consider something that he was required to under the EPBC Act. And that was related to a little skink called the Yakka skink. And um, this cartoon, I think I talked about it in lecture one, but it was about uh, it was around that time um, and, yeah, basically saying, ha, the skink here is saying, I understand there's a risk that your environmental protection laws may inadvertently protect the environment. And this is Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister at the time, and um, Hunt, who was his environment minister, they called it a technical difficulty. And the Prime Minister is saying, oh, believe me, I'm as shocked as you are. And then I also showed you this cartoon in lecture one. Here's the skink and he's looking at um, um, climate change websites, refusing to eat coal and hanging out with other isolated vulnerable species like the um, there was a, a snake species that was also one of the reasons for the decision being set aside and reading the EPBC Act. So um, to me, I, it was a hugely funny um, cartoon because I was you know, involved in that litigation and... Um, had done a lot of work with the EPBC Act. And I wrote an article afterwards saying that it's basically a myth, this argument about there being lawfare. Um, it's just 
a myth because if you actually look at the number of um, referrals, so by that time there had been uh, about 5,000 referrals under the Act um, and only about 30 court cases. So the, the actual number of cases um, brought by both proponents and third parties was only was less than 1% of referrals were actually challenged in court. So it was very small, the number of cases that were being brought. Um, but yeah, it led to these claims of lawfare. And I mentioned that because um, I know a number of you are aware that there's a currently a review of the EPBC Act. So the legislation was written to require each year, sorry, every 10 years, that there would be a review of the Act. So that's due now. Because, um, well, it's, it's two decades on since the Act commenced because it commenced in 16 July 2000. So this is the second 10 yearly review. Uh, and you can read about that on the review website. Public submissions have closed, but yeah, there's, it's been quite a bit in the media. There's ongoing attacks against the Act by the government, industry and the Murdoch Press. Uh, I would just point out that this is part of an ongoing attack against environmental law generally, what I call the green safety net. So nearly a decade ago when this term, the term was being used, green tape, I wrote an article on the Conversation website um, talking about the green safety net and it was intended as an idea to push back against this dysphemism of green tape. So yeah, environmental law is is an important component of protecting us, the community, and the world that we depend upon. Um, so I, yeah, I, we, we see it, we should see it as a safety net, not just this obstacle for um, the community and for industry. And uh, later today, as it turns out, I've got an article uh, coming out. I'm a co-author on an article coming out in Nature Sustainability about the political decision-making under the EPBC Act remaining a massive problem. So I'll send you a link um, to the article when it comes out. Uh, it's, yeah, the title is Science Sidelined in Approval of Australia's Largest Coal Mine. And I've talked about politics uh, enough already. I wanna wrap this lecture up. Um, so let's just answer our three problems and then wrap up this lecture. So in answer to our questions uh, about the problems considered in this lecture, what matters of national environmental significance may be affected by mass culling of flying foxes, a coal port, and um, the Traverson Crossing Dam? So in terms of problem one, did the killing of flying foxes break any laws and could it be stopped? We, I said earlier that yes, it broke state laws and uh, it also um, breached EP, the EPBC Act because um, Cara Booth, we, we went to court uh, under the EPBC Act, we went to the federal court to challenge the mass killing of flying foxes that was occurring on this property. And ultimately we won. So there's a case study on my website about this. The court found that the killing of flying foxes was likely to have a significant impact on the World Heritage Values of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. So the context was there was only about 100,000 bats that were vital for pollination and seed dispersal and part of the biodiversity of the wet tropics. Even though the killing was occurring outside the wet tropics, it um, was still a significant impact. So yes, is the answer to that question. Does it break any laws? Yes, it, it broke the EPBC Act as well as the State Nature Conservation Act. And a conservationist was able to go to court to stop it. The farmer then made a referral under the Act and the um, Commonwealth Minister refused to grant approval for it. And it was the first refusal under the EPBC Act as well. So yeah, case study of it on my website. Um, yeah, and the referral was also refused under the Act. So that's an example of the EPBC Act operating and being an important um, component of the legal system. So, uh, yeah. So problems two and three, do the projects need approval under the Act? And if so, how, can, how does the approval process operate and is approval likely to be granted? Well, starting with the coal port, um, basically there were triggers, the Ramsar um, wetland was a big trigger for it. 
And Peter Garrett, who was the minister at the time, rejected the proposal. He used essentially one of the mechanisms under the Act is where the minister says that a project is clearly unacceptable, they can basically kill it to start with. So he used that power again for the first time and he found that this pro proposal would have clearly unacceptable impacts on the Ramsar wetland and for that reason rejected it. And the project hasn't proceeded since then. So he didn't reject the mine, he rejected the coal port. Also, um, Peter Garrett refused um, the Traverson Crossing Dam. If we think about the triggers, there's a whole range of listed threatened species in the river system, as well as it's going out into a Ramsar wetland. So again, he, the same minister, Peter Garrett, um, he was the lead singer of Midnight Oil and be became a politician and was an environment minister uh, in 2009. He rejected the mine, sorry, the proposed dam as having clearly unacceptable impacts on matters of national environmental significance. So this was occurred in the in the context of a dam that was being proposed by the state Labor government. He was a Labor minister at a federal level. So the politics of this were really pretty dicey and um, yet the minister still took action to stop a project that was proposed by the state government. So these um, projects um, illustrate that the EPPC Act can play an important role. I emphasize projects are rarely refused under the EPBC Act, but it still plays an important role, particularly as a check on large state-sponsored projects like dams. So to wrap up, um, we've covered the history of how we get to the current situation with the Tasmanian Dam case, the relationship between Commonwealth and state laws. We've looked at three problems. I've outlined the operation of the EPBC Act, current, some of the current criticisms um, just want to wrap up. You can read about the Act um, in my synopsis book um, some more. There's the handout um, just as an extract from my synopsis book. That's really all I want you to be aware of for purposes of our course. But the take-home points are also things I want you to be aware of. So six key take-home points. Um, under the Australia's constitution, the Commonwealth Government has the power to enact laws that are reasonably capable of being considered appropriate and adapted to fulfil Australia's international legal obligations. Now, due to the width of Australia's international legal obligations, this gives the Commonwealth a wide power to make laws to protect the environment. Second key point is that under Section 109 of the Commonwealth Constitution, where a state law is inconsistent with Commonwealth law, the Commonwealth law prevails to the extent of inconsistency. Now, true inconsistencies are relatively rare, um, but as the Tasmania Dam case shows, where they do occur, the Commonwealth wins. The EPBC Act has become the cornerstone of Commonwealth environmental laws, and, it's, and the major triggers for approval under it are its impacts on matters of national environmental significance, such as the World Heritage Areas. And while state approvals are much more numerous and state projects rarely stopped under the and sorry and projects are rarely stopped under the EPBC Act, it plays an important role for environmental regulation in Australia, particularly as a check on state sponsored projects. And yeah, there's ongoing attack um, against the EPBC Act. It's part of a broader deregulatory program. There's a proposal for a one stop shop also claims about lawfare. There's this ongoing review. I don't believe the current review is going to result in any improvements to the EPBC Act, and it's not going to change the political decision making under it. Um, I haven't made a submission about to this latest review um, because of that. I just don't see the current government is not going to improve the Act. They're only going to use the review to weaken it. Um, so we'll see in coming months what they do with the review. But yeah, it's it's not an actor that the current government actually likes to use. And we're still caught up in this whole political sort of washing machine that keeps coming around with these issues. And it's still difficult to enforce these laws against the mining sector as well as the farming sector. Okay, that's the lecture.